so thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, and pay my respects to elders past and present, um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd also like to thank our um, community members and our consumers that are here today. So my role today is just to give you a little bit of uh, flavor of the Reporting for Better Cancer Outcomes program before we hear from some real world um, scenarios from two of our um, presenters in an international scenario. Um, and we did the poll and I think about half the people that answered had not heard of the Reporting for Better Cancer Outcomes program. So that's absolutely fabulous news for me because um, it means I have all your contact details, I think, um, <laughs> to bring you into the family. So I'd like to just give you a bit of an overview of what the Reporting for Better Cancer Outcomes program is. Um, just adding to what David has said, um, give you a bit of a feel of why we think this program is important. Again, adding to the video you've just seen. And last but not least, share a couple of approaches on how the information can be used to drive change. So we've already heard a little bit about what the program is. So Reporting for Better Cancer Outcomes pro is one of the Cancer Institute's flagship programs. It's our quality improvement and performance reporting program. As we heard, the program actually consists of a suite of reports, and I'll talk a little bit more about these later. And these reports are in New South Wales as well as ACT. These reports then provide a tool and a mechanism for engagement and facilitation of quality improvement. So we now know what's in the reports, which is great. We'll be quizzing everyone at the end. So, um, and we also know what data sets are existing within the reports and are coming up. So the program provides a mechanism to engage all levels of the health system. So board reports, for example, may actually focus on key strategic summary points that are selected by that district, for example, and detailed clinician reports also focus on key questions that are posed by the health system. So you get different sizes of the reports and different versions of the reports, but it really is about collecting data once and using in many, in many ways. So we produce multiple products um, fit for purpose, and this year, again, is the eighth year of, of reporting for Better Cancer Outcomes program. So one of the things I thought I'd recap on is um, some of the principles that the program uses. So the program is really not just a report. And what that means is it's also a quality improvement program. So it uses modern principles of quality improvement. So not quality assurance and not quality control. There's a space for that in clinical governance. But this really is about quality improvement to drive change. It is built on those other principles. For example, it's about raising the general standard of care across the system and not a focus on poor, uh, pockets of poor practice. It's about working to understand the context in which the data are, are placed in and working with a no blame approach. In short, the focus of the program is on processes, best evidence, systems, and supporting teams and individuals to reflect and drive improvements. So why is the program important just in case? You haven't got that yet. The program provides a mechanism of engagement at all levels of the health system, so from frontline clinicians to executive teams and beyond in the boards. It highlights variation in key quality and performance measures and indicators. It turns data into information and knowledge, allowing us to identify where we can make the biggest difference. It supports the delivery of best practice, use of current evidence, which is what our indicators are based on, and the implementation of continuous quality improvement. Overall, it seeks to influence the health system to contribute to lessening the impact of cancer across the system. So how can we drive change? So again, as I mentioned before, Robka provides a mechanism for engagement from frontline to executive. Engagement starts when we develop the reports through collaborating with our clinician advisory groups, clinical leaders and experts, and in co-designing the reports we actually produce. Feedback cycles are one of the most important components of the program. Annual feedback occurs at the chief executive level with senior staff and executives and other staff members. Following this, the report then starts walking. It's distributed in many different ways to boards, to clinical governance committees, and to multidisciplinary teams. And we're getting a little bit better on making sure our reports are bespoke and suited for all those groups. Interim and clinician advisory groups also, reports are also produced at the clinician level throughout the year. These can then be tabled at their chief executive meetings as requested and are also used to co-design other reports and implement change. So it's really about both the top down and bottom up as well as horizontal approach because I believe you need all levels of change. 
So if we get into the highlighting and understanding the variation. So one of the indicators that we have in the report, and as um, David Caro just talked about, you can actually see the report yourself. You can go online and look at our um, statewide report that was launched on Tuesday. One of the um, things that the report does is highlight variation in key quality measures. So this is about um, uh, fractionation for painful bony metastases. So external beam radiotherapy is a recommended treatment for cancer that is spread to the bone and is causing pain without any other complications. So long-term evidence shows that radiotherapy treatment using single fraction dose is as effective as using multiple fractions, so more than one, or more than a single one, for relieving bo pain, bone pain for most people with, with this pain and no complications. So what this chart is showing is for that particular local health district, they're actually receive, um, giving that value of bony metastasis. So that would be your left is the single, the blue, the dark blue color. But I think this indicates what most importantly, this is what I'm trying to show you is not quite, and not the numbers, but what I'm trying to show you is that in the report, you not only see what your area is giving, but also how are you doing a, you know, when you look um, at New South Wales as well, which is that top line for the district. And even more so, you can actually see how you're going across the state. So when you're actually compared with the other districts or other areas or other radiotherapy treatment centers. So by highlighting this variation, we can start conversations to understand the variation and address any signals the information might be showing us. So it is about starting the conversation. Using another indicator that's in the report. So in addition, in this chart, we see the proportion, we'll be seeing in a minute, the proportion of breast cancer resections with sentinel lymph node biopsy in one year. So for example, that line shows us what the value was in 2011 um, across New South Wales. But we can also see what was going on across each of the local health district in that year. And this is what Professor Cora talked about in the, at the beginning in terms of um, sentinel lymph node biopsy and outcomes. So we know that there's been considerable effort going on behind the scenes in each local health district. So we can see that then, after a few years in 2016, the New South Wales average has actually moved in the right direction, which is great. But each area can also see how they've been tracking them in time. So with the blue lines now showing how they're going in 2016. So you can see the change over time. So not just see how you did, not just see how you did last year, but see how you did in the following years. And how did you actually compare to all your peers? And most importantly with that, if let's just say you weren't doing so well, or you think there's something to investigate, you can actually see who are, who are the people that are doing a great job? How can we actually learn from those other people and scale up or adapt what it is they're doing? And in some areas, you might not want to be doing that procedure, and we might hear about that a little bit later. And so you might not want that number to increase in some areas. But again, it is about showing some variation, showing what the results are and starting the conversations. So how can we identify where we can make the biggest impact as well? So the program uses data, which is really unprocessed fact and figures from multiple sources that we've already talked about, and works collaboratively to put this data into context. So when the data is in context, for example, what region is it being um, collected in? It gives it meaning and it turns this data into information. So putting it in context at both the system and the local level. And working closely with clinicians, managers, and executives, and other people, with experience in the health system, we can turn this information into, into knowledge, making it useful. For example, when we look at extent of disease, which has been spoken about in one of the other sessions. So extent of disease, this is the blue bars that you can see, so how far the cancer has spread, whether it's localized, regional, or distant, is about taking data and information from our incidence and mortality data sets in the New South Wales Cancer Registry. For the all-cause survival, which is the line above those bars, it is about taking data from this incidence and mortality data set and then linking it to the registry births and deaths and marriages data set. So it is about linking those pieces of information. By combining these two sets of information into data with meaning, that is information, mm -hmm. and turning it into knowledge that is useful for both primary and tertiary care, we can see from that chart that the lesser the extent of disease, a diagnosis, the higher the survival rate. So it starts to give us a different picture of how things are going and how we might be able to move forward. So again, the program supports the delivery of best practice, use of current evidence, and implementation of continuous quality improvement. 
So you've got a whole heap of knowledge now, what's next? <laughs> so you might think. So it's about decision and action is what happens next. So decision and action is actually required at those annual forums and where we give feedback to clinicians and to local health districts. There's a lot of information in each report and there's a lot of information out there. It's not an easy job and my role, again, and the team's role is to support um, each of the areas and help them in any other data they might need to be able to make a decision. And from this decision, the teams then prioritise what they can continue with continuous quality improvement. So a decision and a priority is made, then the fund begins, which we'll hear about in a short time from um, both Mel and Stephen. Further investigation is do then done at the local health district, and we support this as well in any way we can. Each of the areas, whether they're again primary health network, local health districts or hospitals, then continue with interventions. So they might do plan, do, study, act cycles, quality improvement cycles. There are a lot of ways that you can look at improvement, but they might choose whatever it is that they think works for them. But an intervention is done or something we hope that will make a difference. We test and we see what's happened. We test again, we try something else, we adapt and we look at the data again. So continuous cycles of reflection and refinement. Then we look at the impact. We come back around again for those moments of reflection to look at our data and how things are going and our information. And then we work towards sustainability and improvement. And we'll hear about these journeys in a moment. But the foundation of Robco has now been set over eight years, and we're now focusing on learning more, sharing and scaling up our, our, and celebrating successes. So if you have any successes from Robco, please see me. I'd like to come with some cake. <laughs> so my Skip that one. So recapping on the principles of the program, it is informed by evidence and best practice. It's about creating multiple products that are fit for purpose for any of our stakeholders. It is about optimizing and linking existing data that we already have, and then doing maybe deep dives at the local areas with audits where we don't have that information. It's about a collaborative approach, and also at all levels of the health system, clinicians, managers, executives, and support staff and using, again, those quality improvement principles of raising the general standard of care, reducing our variation, and a no-blame approach. So I encourage you to have a look at online at our annual Cancer Control New South Wales report. I encourage you to spot these three people that are here at the conference as well <laughs> that didn't realise they were in the talk. And on behalf of the team and our clinical champions, most of whom are in, are in the room and our leaders across the system, welcome to the Robco family. So if you'd like more information, please email us on that email on the screen and I'll send you an information pack. You can even put just tell me more Robco in the subject line and you'll get something. Um, so thank you, that's all. Thanks, Ruth. If you could uh, stay there for a second and if I could invite David to sit in the chat pit of fun, he's, he's got a microphone. Uh, any questions or comments on, on what you've seen so far? Hand up if you're hearing about this uh, for the first time, really getting some detailed sense of it. Right, so uh, uh, quite a number, but quite a number uh, are familiar with it. Any questions or comments, please? Oh, there's one there. I, 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 people are coming in via the app. I, like, I still like the human question in the room. <laughs> Do you want to just come out here so I can stare, they can stare at you? Uh, so this is uh, Lisa, my beautiful assistant, and these are people with questions from the app. How are the measures decided upon for Robco? Does the Cancer Institute set these, or do the LHDs? It's really a process of evolution. Um, we started uh, reporting better cancer outcomes, and I regard one of the really great signs of success is that people are now knocking on our door and saying, we'd like an indicator on this particular issue uh, or we'd like an analysis that, uh, that looks at this particular problem. So, um, you know, it's in evolution. And I think uh, that one of the greatest signs that this is actually engaging people's hearts and minds is that uh, those, those suggestions are now coming from clinicians, from service directors uh, and uh, from their networks. So, and to add to that, we're, I suppose, continuously scanning the international system as well to see what else are the people reporting that we can report in New South Wales. Um, and in addition, like David said, I think it's about the, um, the engagement that we're having at the moment. What happens is you show one page and people have five questions. <laughs> so you go back to the team and 
they're very lovely and they're very patient <laughs> and they do the, the next bit of analysis. And just I think in um, the last cycle of Robco we had 64 suggestions that we're working through. So every year we get more suggestions and more questions through what we show. The other one was, how are consumers involved in Robco? I think that's a fantastic question. <laughs> <laughs> Could I just um, say, about, yeah, I, yeah, I, I was personally very disappointed to see we weren't yet members of the family, uh, particularly when you've been going for eight years. And I, you know, we know that in the cancer world there are many sophisticated organised, you know, community organisations around particular cancer groups. I mean, I, David taught me about some of them in the past, and I'm just wondering why you haven't engaged more with those more directly affected. Not, I know you're going to do patient outcomes. Mm -hmm but those more sophisticated people who've, who've learned a bit about the system and may have something to offer. So we have a consumer panel at Cancer Institute New South Wales. We advertise uh, in uh, the media for those positions and we engage with those people as part of our clinical advisory networks. Our clinical advisory groups are, are time limited, so we don't just set them up and let them run. We uh, have them built around specific questions, one or two questions. Uh, they may have between three and five, three and six meetings, uh, and uh, depending on the issues that are being dealt with, uh, we, would have, uh, we would have consumer input. If it's arguing about procedure codes, um, you know, that's about as fun as watching paint dry. Uh, and well, the counter view is building health literacy, sophisticated health literacy among highly motiv motivated consumer groups. And we're doing a number of things in uh, that process of building health literacy. And I think uh, as you look at the statewide report, you will be uh, uh, really pleased to see what has been put in place there. And Rue's team have uh, also produced a really um, great guide to how to read uh, these graphs and, uh, and tables uh, in order to get the most information out of them. And to add to that, I suppose, um, and, and the report, we got a bit of feedback as well from our consumer um, and community advisory panel at the Cancer Institute, which was, which was fantastic. And the next step being, with our guide to understanding charts, we'll be getting the consumer and community advisory panel to actually give us feedback on does that make sense? Does that help someone who's actually picking up the report, um, who might be a consumer, carer, um, or someone diagnosed with cancer, to be able to understand our data and our charts? So that's our next step with the, with the panel. Um, that's been involved in the in the last statewide report. Thank you. Is there anyone else with a, a, a question or comment in relation to this? Thank you. You can run towards me too, or meet halfway. I, I did say it's time of afternoon. I hold it. Okay. Right. Yes. My <laughs> name is Lisa Pitts. I'm from the Illawarra Shoalhaven Local Health District. Um, as we know, with data, um, good, great data at the point of entry is a wonderful thing. But we can't always guarantee that as data is entered that it's going to be good quality. So really you're, you're working with what you've, you've given. So how do you guarantee or how, how do you check for the quality of the data that you're working with? I'm sure there's a more technical answer with the checking part because <laughs> we do have quality people. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll answer that and then David can go. But um, I suppose every piece of data and information, every number has an asterisk to it. Um, there's no data that'll come without the list of caveats, the footnotes, or the asterisks. Everything will have an asterisk to it because even the truest of facts will change over time. Um, but in terms of that, I think what we heard before is what I, um, I am thinking about is about what can we do with what we have? And data that is fit for purpose is really what, the way we need to think about it. What is that data fit for and for what purpose? So thinking of it, I think, that way is the best way to think about it. What we have, is it maybe not complete, but it's giving us a bit of a, of a signal of something, and we can start there. Because if we don't start to look at it, we can't ever hope to improve the quality until we start looking at it and sharing that round. Because I think one of the questions that was um, raised before was around, um, might, might we come up to the wrong conclusions? But I think if we don't do anything, is that are we worse off if we do nothing and don't share that data and look at it? Because with looking at it, even if the quality might be of a certain level, whatever level that is, we can actually have more questions and have a curiosity to the data. And once you start feeding it back, that is the first step to actually improving it. And then the quote I do think of is Edward Deming's quote of, you know, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. To make it, let's, let's start there with the data. So I completely take, take your point. 
Um, but having said that, with the Institute, we do have a whole team of analysts that I cannot explain what exactly how they do it. But I think with eight years uh, of Robco, I think that is one of the things that we can say we have trusted an analyst, analytics. Um, and, and their processes are quite trusted, and, 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 and we can guarantee that. I don't know um, if David wanted to answer well, as well. We've worked really hard, yeah. and particularly with clinicians uh, who've said, look, we don't believe the data. We actually go down into dusty uh, medical records uh, cellars and, and go through records with them. Uh, that sort of process has been absolutely invaluable in, in reassuring them uh, and us that the data are accurate. But back to, to Craig's point, if you don't feed the data back, you will, you will never uh, have the, the quality of the data improved. So fit for purpose uh, and a feedback loop is, is actually driving some really fantastic changes uh, across the state. We've, we've had uh, clinicians go and talk to their medical coders for the first time in their life. Uh, and uh, actually help to understand how we can improve the quality of those data. Uh, I'll ask us one quick question and introduce our next speaker, but you're clearly showing each local health district how they're performing relative to each other. So I suppose that becomes a giant motivator for the chief executives to check you're getting it right, particularly if they're not performing as well as many others. Look, it's a huge motivator, but I think the other thing is we also look, as Rue has said, to the international literature. Are we seeing the same magnitude and direction uh, as best practice from around the world? If we're not, uh, is it because our data are wrong or because there's something wrong in the system? And that's what we need to ask. But it's a huge motivator, and people are very competitive in health. They want to do the best. Well, I can uh, tell you, as, as a patient, said, I was looking at where St Vincent's was in all the lists. You, you, you know, in a way, it can be a tool for patient advocacy too, can't it? Hugely. Yeah. Look, thank you so much, guys. A round of applause yeah. for Rue.